although he was raised in the South Holland town of Turar, which is a part of the municipality of Neokoop. Willem van Eijk was born on August 13, 1941, in Kortenaar. Willem has five older brothers and was the sixth and youngest kid. He had a younger sister as well, although she was only two years old. Willem's mother has been deeply wounded by the loss of her daughter. She subsequently treated Willem like a girl and made him wear girls' attire on a regular basis. As you are aware, a child's growth is significantly impacted by this. Willem's mother also maintained a hand above her head at all times, despite the fact that she wasn't exactly a warm person. As a result, she spoiled Willem a lot. Whereas Willem's mother is criticized, his father is praised for being a hard-working gasoline salesman and bicycle mechanic. He served as a bridge keeper as well. Willem was an obnoxious child who struggled to learn properly making him a poor student. He had a lot of difficulties speaking. Willem got into thieving when he was a kid, initially from members of his own family, but eventually from neighbors and other villagers as well. He is noted as having a challenging and hostile personality. His niece describes him as scary. She talks about how he used to shoot frogs off with a gun after hanging them on the clothesline as a kid. He accompanied his uncle on a hunting trip, whereupon he supposedly accidentally shot a dog. Willem was allegedly quite brutal to animals, according to several people. It appears that he tormented cats and dogs when he was younger. He poured gasoline on his neighbor's dog, for instance, and then set the beast on fire. Willem was referred to as evil in person by his brothers when he was still a little child, only around seven years old. Even while this description is extremely vivid, it makes sense when you consider how he interacts with animals, as you may already be aware. There are allegedly three signs that a child may develop into a serial killer or another type of violent criminal. The McDonald Triad, developed in 1966, identifies the following three signs. Abuse of animals, particularly pets, pyromania, and frequent bedwetting as a child. A youngster is unlikely to satisfy all three requirements. Important Information, J.M. McDonald, the psychiatrist who wrote this paper, did not firmly feel that his research and adult aggression were causally related, but when examining the youth of serial killers, his triad is still mentioned. Willem thus satisfies the first indicator, animal mistreatment. McDonald thought that a child's urge to dominate his or her environment was what led to animal maltreatment. When a youngster is humiliated by others, especially by adults in positions of control, they develop this urge. The child will naturally become frustrated by this and wish to vent their feelings on something weak and vulnerable, like a pet. The validity of the McDonald triad and its applicability have been the subject of a significant amount of research over the years. The triad is more dependable as a predictor of whether a child is being neglected or abused. That is, if a child is living with a dysfunctional family setting, therefore it need not be fully discounted. Willem had the moniker Mad Willem Pie when he was a little child, and it lasted with him for a very long time. He was even called that as an adult. He was fearless because he had a lot of guts. He always had a threatening air about him, to get his way. He made threats of using force. He threatened to demand free beer at a cafe, for instance, while carrying a grenade. He threatened to get his gun whenever he got into a disagreement with someone. In the documentary, an elderly villager describes how Willem stood at the bar and began rummaging through his jacket pocket. He fumbled around in his pocket briefly before pulling his rifle out and setting it on the bar. The rifle was taken from him and placed back in his pocket. Willem quickly found himself in trouble with the law after committing theft and burglaries. He acquired a criminal record in 1964, and in 1966, he spent a short time in prison before going missing. A psychiatric evaluation was performed on him under the court's directive. It was determined that he lacked intelligence and was belligerent. Willem behaved admirably from a young age. Interestingly, others always discounted this conduct as being normal for him because he was just crazy Willem Pye. Nobody else seemed to give his strange actions any thought. Willem also frequently behaved in a macho manner toward males, as if he needed to prove that he was a true guy. He pretended to be tough around guys but was distant towards ladies. Contact with women was thus challenging. This is, of course, partially a result of his own actions, as ladies viewed him as a creep. He began having intense fantasies about women in his early 20 seconds, in which he killed them by slicing their tummies. Willem is heard saying that he wanted to be in command of the woman in audio recordings made by Peter R. DeFries. That simply wasn't enough for him, she had to be under his control. He put it like this, covet, have, and destroy. So vivid dreams were the beginning, but soon they were insufficient. William desired movement. He desired the truth. When he picked up Cora Mantle, a 15-year-old from Uathorn, on June 20, 1971, his behavior finally got worse. It is said that Cora is innocent and daring, but that is typical of a 15-year-old girl. She and her buddies would occasionally hitchhike to Amsterdam. 
Cora had also visited her boyfriend in Amsterdam on June 20, 1971. Her boyfriend drove her to the bus stop after they had left. They learned they had missed the last bus at the bus stop. As a result, Cora made the decision to hitchhike from Stadion Plein to her home because she had done so before. Unfortunately, Willem, who had just finished drinking beer at an Amsterdam cafe, picked up Cora. At that time, Willem mostly lived alone and spent the evenings hunting for ladies. He recognized this as a rare opportunity when he came across Cora hitchhiking on the side of the road, so that they would be outside. He drove Cora with him in the direction of a polder. He pushed himself on her after stopping the car, but she resisted. Cora was then R-worded before being strangled with her own scarf. A few hours later, he discarded her dead in a ditch. Years later, when Willem finally admitted to killing Cora, he denied ever having R-worded her but eventually admitted that he had done so after she had passed away. The following day, on June 21, 1971, Cora's naked body was discovered. It took the police more than 10 hours to identify her after they discovered her dead. An engraving on her watch serving as a repair mark allowed it to eventually succeed. The police launched an investigation right after, and an all-smear jeweler was initially suspected. Cora was scheduled to start her new work at this jeweler the morning of the murder, therefore this was the reason. In addition to the 15,000 guilders from the public prosecutor, Cora's father was prepared to offer the person with the golden tip a reward of 10,000 guilders. Sadly, no results came from this because the police stopped looking into the matter further. On June 25, 1971, Cora was laid to rest in Brooklyn. Willem was able to live out the rest of his life in peace because the police were unable to advance their inquiry. He commits another murder a few years after Cora was killed. Willem met his second victim, a Gorinkum nurse named Ulch van der Plot, 44, on August 19, 1974. After attending church in Tur R with her family, Ulch made the decision to go for a stroll. Willem happened to be on his upper deck when she passed by his houseboat. Willem made the decision to attack when he spotted her. He seized a knife before mounting his moped and pursuing Ulch. Ulch resisted Willem much like Cora did. But this time Willem fulfilled his actual goal by our wording, strangling, slitting her neck, cutting open her stomach, and chopping off her left breast. The fact that he did not cut Cora open is consequently surprising considering that this had been his desire for a while. This, according to experts, is because Cora was his first murder victim and victim as well. The initial murder differs in execution from the subsequent murders. You see this more frequently with serial killers. In a cornfield not far from Turar, a heavily battered and naked body of Ulch was discovered. She had numerous stab wounds and serious slashes. Ulch's face was severely constricted when her body was discovered, which is not surprising given what she had to go through. On the night his moped was killed, Willem was observed traveling close to the crime scene by numerous individuals. As a result, the police located Willem right away, and the next day he was taken into custody. Willem was of course intensively questioned after his detention. The questioning was challenging at first, but he eventually confessed. Alge's murder was committed, but so was Cora's. When the authorities brought up the connection between the two killings during the interrogation, Willem reportedly confessed, probably in an effort to hire a more accommodating staff. Willem's initial prison term was 20 years. However, after an appeal, this was reduced to 18 years plus TBR predecessor of TBS provision. Due to the spontaneous nature of the crimes, no life term was handed. Willem was admitted to the Van Mesdag facility in Groningen in 1975 as a condition of his sentence. People who suffer from a paranoid, antisocial, or narcissistic personality disorder are treated here. These individuals belong to the most severe group of TBS sufferers and are the most challenging to cure. Thus, the Van Mesdag Clinic can be compared to the Broadmoor Hospital from our earlier Silent Twins episode. Willen was of course once more examined at this clinic, and this time it was determined that he was a risky and dishonest individual. Willem's refusal to take his medication and to participate in counseling didn't help. He fiercely disagreed with his own therapy as a result. He frequently found himself in solitary confinement and engaged in numerous alterations as a result of his actions. He was really difficult to treat. Willem was initially given permission to go on supervised leave in 1979. This practice is governed by law and is a component of the therapy. Actually, he had been given permission to take a leave of absence before, but it was cancelled due to his actions. Willem said that this was because his practitioners were against him. Nevertheless, in 1979 he was eventually given permission to take a leave of absence and went to an intercourse club with a security guard. He broke the rules by going upstairs with an anime girl in this club. His monitored leave was revoked for a specific amount of time as a punishment. Willem made the decision to publish a personal ad in the Neosblad Van Het Norden in March 1980. Willem may not have been particularly intelligent, but he was not a fool. 
He was aware that having a relationship would make him look good to his practitioners. Willem stated that he was a driver who frequently traveled abroad in the advertisement. His contact ad received a response quickly. They set up a meeting after a dream. A single mother of five spotted the ad in the paper and expressed interest in talking. Willem was meant to meet them at the Groningen train station, but he failed to do so, ostensibly because he was away. A few days later, a representative from the Van Mesdag clinic knocked on Andre's door and pleaded with her not to get in touch with Willem. Willem had already been segregated at that point. Andre decided to get in touch with Willem after a week, despite being asked not to. She admitted this was a result of her stubbornness. She was equally curious and wanted to go. Willem gave her a brief explanation of his visit to the clinic. She was stunned by this, but it didn't keep her from getting in touch with him again. She believed that she had to start a new life with him. Willem liked this since it was simpler for him to maintain the image that he could function in society with a wife. In 1981, they became engaged, and in 1982, they wed while incarcerated. In addition, Adri misled her family about the reason why Willem was incarcerated. It was agreed that Willem's TBS would be lifted and that he could leave the facility on June 6, 1990. After years of struggle, a study came to the conclusion that his issues had not been addressed and that he would have an antisocial personality with a psychotic core. Throughout his tenure, it was acknowledged that he consistently rejected treatment. His early childhood traumas would not have been dealt with as a result. Nevertheless, it was also determined that this did not necessarily imply that he had not changed. The professionals said Adri was a crucial source of emotional support. However, a catastrophic tragedy like a divorce would reawaken the scars from his early years and reawaken the psychotic aspect of his psyche. Despite all of these findings, Willem was let go without any instructions. Since his release, he has never been watched over. Adri and Willem relocated to a small farm outside of the Groningen community of Harkstead. Willem made the decision to live outside on purpose because he was an avid hunter and outdoorsman who had no concept of social control. This was also advantageous for Adri because she worked for the animal ambulance and frequently received calls from people who needed to put animals down. On their farm, they had room for this. Adri claimed that Willem loved animals. Regular interns at the animal ambulance were young women who were around 15 or 16 years old. Willem bullied these females by being extremely forceful among other things. Adri had failed to see these warning signs. Even still, after around 1.5 years, Willem and Adri's relationship deteriorated. They fought more frequently, and Willem began to drink more and more. Willem claims that Adri declined to have intercourse with him but actually declined to perform certain things that he wanted to do. Willem frequently rode his moped to visit prostitutes, according to Adri. He was so frequently seen in the area designated for streetwalkers. The naked death of 23-year-old Romanian prostitute Michelle Fadal was discovered in a ditch on November 5, 1993, some 26 kilometers from Harkstead, where Adri and Willem had been staying for some time. She had been strangled, an investigation showed. A neighborhood inquiry was started right away, but because there were no eyewitnesses, it produced no results. Speaking with any witnesses became challenging because they were secretive about their excursions to the neighborhood street walking zone. Willem's first identified victim after being freed and moving to Harkstead is Michelle. Willem asserts that although he can't recall the exact time or day of the murder, it took place under a railroad overpass during the day. He had driven his automobile to the street walking lane to pick her up. The body of Harlingen resident Annelies Reinders, 31, was discovered in the Eames Canal on January 21, 1995, at a pingdom, which is also around 26 kilometers from Harkstead. Annelies was a street-based prostitute, just like Michelle. Annelies had been missing for six weeks prior to her body being discovered. With a rope around her neck, she was both R-worded and strangled. Willem scooped her up with his car from the sidewalk, just like he had Michelle. Unfortunately, individuals with nefarious motives can easily prey on prostitutes. The ladies were not supposed to leave the sidewalk walking lane, yet they did so at great personal danger. If you simply get into someone's car, there is still risk because you put yourself in danger right away. But if you really need the money, it can be difficult to refuse a solid offer, since many of the prostitutes had drug addictions. This was frequently the case. The breakdown of Willem and Adri's marriage occurred in 1998. They got into another heated argument, but this time Willem really wounded Adri physically by beating her. The moment Adri realized this, she made the decision to leave him. Simply put, this wasn't simple. Her daughters removed her from the farm she co-owned with Willem and arranged for her to find a new residence through her doctor. Willem continued to frequently invite prostitutes over to his house after Adri left. Due to the heavy drinking, he had lost both his automobile and driver's license, leaving just his moped. However, since using a moped makes it difficult to find prostitutes in the street walking zone, he called them and asked them to visit his farm. 
Sasha Schenker, a 34-year-old prostitute, was found dead in her underwear on July 17, 2001 in the Slotcher Dip, close to Harkstead. By that time, she had been absent for a week. She was last spotted borrowing a scooter, after which she vanished. There were a lot of rumors and tips concerning the potential offender that were received. Sasja visited Willem's home at his request because he was one of her regular clients. Sasja allegedly spent a few hours dozing off on Willem's couch. She would have been awakened and told not to report to work by him. Then, on a whim, he suddenly struck her in the head with a beer bottle. He claimed that out of panic, he used his hands to strangle her. Many people showed up for her funeral. Sasja's son was separated from his mother when she passed away. Sasja was the fourth dead prostitute discovered in the river whose killer was nowhere to be identified. Strangely, the Groningen police did not believe it to be a case of a serial killer but rather individual instance. By speaking with prostitutes, a small farm in Harkstead that prostitutes frequently visited was revealed. Prostitutes asserted that they could always phone the resident if money was needed, as arrangements could then be made. The authorities were already aware of Willem's past, so they were able to locate him very fast. Sasja had been at Willem's house the night before she vanished, according to phone exchanges. Willem was then requested by the authorities to testify, although he vehemently denied any involvement in her demise. He wasn't the one who had phoned Sasja as one of the last. Thus he wasn't viewed as a suspect either. He was interrogated by the police for two hours before being given permission to depart. The police chose to scuba dive here after Sasja was discovered in the Slotstradip. The search went on after this when a piece of clothing in a plastic bag was found. Eventually, three bags filled with garments that were weighed down by stones were discovered. It is believed that the clothing in the other bags belonged to Michelle and Annelies, while one bag held Sasja's clothes. Willem's house was the only residence in the neighborhood where the bags of clothing were discovered, but there was also a finishing area close by. Therefore, the association wasn't entirely complete. The Groningen police were alerted by several therapists who had previously treated Willem that he might be involved for the killings, but they already knew that he was a cutter and not a strangler. Nevertheless, the police made the decision to travel to Turar in order to look into the deaths of Cora and Alch. The light eventually turned on when they learned that strangulation was the cause of Cora's death. The connection was only truly established when it was discovered that Cora's and Alch's clothing had also been discovered in the water close to his houseboat in bags that had been loaded down with pebbles. On November 12, 2001, Willem was eventually placed under custody. Naturally, Willem was questioned, but there was also a search of the tangible evidence. It turned out that when Willem went eel fishing, he secured fish traps with a very particular kind of rope. This particular rope was also used to murder Annelise. It didn't take long for Willem to admit to killing Michelle, Annelise, and Sasha after this connection was discovered. Although it cannot be totally out that Willem committed other murders, the Groningen police were immensely happy of the work they had done and that they had captured him, in particular because Sasja's murder occurred six or seven years after Annelies. Therefore, it is conceivable that Willem committed more homicides than he admitted to committing and for which he was tried. Numerous prostitutes in the area went missing or perished while Willem was operating. Several prostitute deaths and missing prostitute cases have been re-examined in the wake of Willem's capture and confession. The following three ladies are speculated to have been Willem victims as well. Antoinette Bont's torso, who was 24 years old, was discovered on July 31, 1995, in Winscoterdip, roughly 17 kilometers from Harkstead. Later, a bag containing her arms and legs was located. She never had her head found. The body of Shirley Heeragers was discovered in Groningen on May 2, 1997. Strangulation was found to be the cause of death. Later, a scarf with Shirley's blood on it was discovered at Willem's home. It was well known that he knew her and had killed her. Jolanda Major, age 35, vanished sometime around February 7, 1998. She was last seen on that day. A thorough investigation by the police was started, but it was suspended after three weeks. Jolanda's parents were determined to find out what was going on, so they traveled to Friesland, Groningen, and even Germany to speak with street vendors. It is well known that Jolanda frequently stopped by Willem's residence. And Willem also acknowledged knowing her. Adri claimed that Jolanda was given to their swine. After Jolanda vanished, nobody was permitted to approach the boar. In actuality, the boar was delivered to the butcher shop a few weeks later. The Canadian serial killer and pig farmer Robert Woolley Picton also fed the prostitutes he killed to his pigs. Therefore Willem is not the first serial killer to have done so. Since pigs are real omnivores, they are more frequently used to dispose of corpses. In 2003, extensive DNA analysis was once more carried out on Willem's farm and in his backyard. Unfortunately, nothing was discovered that connected Willem to the potential other victims besides the scarf stained with Shirley's blood. 
Willem has never been aware of more homicides than the five for which he has been prosecuted. Additionally, he has never sought to discuss the reason behind the killings. He insisted that it always happened by accident. Willem consistently shifted responsibility away from himself and toward others. He had a difficult upbringing, was bullied, and then all of a sudden decided to get even. Although he never admitted guilt, he said under questioning that he had understood during a murder that he had to continue because the victim would otherwise call the police. This decision made it possible for him to face a murder trial. It demonstrates that he considered the repercussions of his decision and yet carried it out. The Groningen court sentenced Willem to life in prison on November 7, 2002. While incarcerated, he continued to cause issues. He was uncontrollable. He has thus been moved to different prisons on numerous occasions. Due to major behavioral issues, he was transferred once more in 2019, and as a result, he ended up in VUT. He died here on June 19, 2019. About the cause of death, the Public Prosecution Service does not wish to comment.